All right, team. Welcome to Friday Forum, October 1st, 2021. The first day of the last quarter of 2021. Final push into the end of the year. So strong performance so far, three quarters in and really hard push for the last one. So let's make it count. Um, every week seems to be a big week. This week is no less of a week than all of them. So uh, starting things off, Casey was showcased alongside other thought leaders in the world at the Code Conference. Um, it was really amazing to see what happened from a UGC perspective. So on Instagram and Twitter, people started taking this uh, these insights that Casey was sharing around metabolic health and what Levels is doing to be a part of that, how there is a major epidemic in the world. And, uh, and it really felt like the movement where people were spreading the awareness of what we're working on. And so props to Casey for that. Um, she also had top right corner. You can see she had a moment to really geek out with one of her uh, one of her longtime heroes, Sam Harris. So that was pretty cool. Uh, the podcast continues to scale up with listeners and traction. So Casey and Sarah's episode is the first to reach a thousand plus listens and it did it in less than a week, which is incredible. So if you look at the graph in the middle of the slide, a whole new level, you can see there's some major exponential growth going on there, which is pretty cool. Um, we'll continue to see that as we have more people like Rob and Sarah and all these thought leaders on and put out more content week over week. Um, the ops team continues to crush it and really come through uh, with world-class member support. 90% of the emails were responded to in less than an hour, which was a new record this week. So hat tip to the entire ops team. Uh, as well, the ops team is starting to work with the text analytics vendor Thematic to get deeper analysis for gleaning insights from inbound emails. So Chris is leading that initiative, and it's going to be really cool to see what, what type of insights and data we can really mine from that. Uh, partner content is con contributing to the movement. So uh, organic IG posts from Ben Greenfield and Kelly Levesque. Ben was just applying a sensor and Kelly was uh, sharing a clip from the podcast that we did with her last week. Um, sorry, it dropped this week. Uh, but between the two of them, they each shared these videos and that's they got over 70,000 views or impressions, which was incredible to see. Um, new partners, affiliates, and VIPs joined this week. A few no notable ones, Dr. James D. Nicolantonio, Nicol who is the author of The Salt Fix, Marquez Brown Lee, who is one of the biggest creators and YouTubers in the world. Uh, he's got over 2.7 billion views on his channel, 14.8 million subs, which is incredible. Um, and then Dr. Phil Golia, who is a celebrity nutritionist, most notably worked on the actors in the Marvel movie and works with the Kardashians. Uh, lastly, exploration in the B2B sports category continues to be strong. Uh, the Chicago Cubs dietitian is all in on levels and trying to spread, uh, spread the love throughout the organization. And then there are ongoing conversations with the Equinox and, uh, and CrossFit head offices. So very cool. Um, other notable highlights. So uh, Casey had a couple podcasts drop this week, Everyday Wellness, uh, What the Funk, which is a comedy podcast also recorded for the genius life which is a tier one show and then uh david recorded for product love which was very cool we've got bottom right corner you can see rodney representing that is a youtube thumbnail so we're trying out an experiment to use uh, different thumbnails on youtube to like really sh show i guess uh, put, put a better brand foot forward as far as the content that we put out. So it's a bit of an experiment and we're going to see how videos perform benchmarked against ones that don't have any thumbnails. Uh, growth strategy doc that was updated this week, uh, a bit more along the vision and the things that we've been talking about as a company, a debrief for the military um, pilot that was done. And Let's see the last thing on here. So very cool. Uh, Sam will be very happy to hear this. This content piece right here, UGC, is somebody who you can't see what it says, but they said levels shows you the way food affects your health. So the mission is spreading, and the week over week, uh, the week over week tie-ins, very cool. Um, so that is it. Highlights for the week, and on to our special guest. So this week we have Rahul, Rahul Vorha, whom everybody is familiar with. Uh, we're all very avid users of Superhuman. Um, Rahul, a bit of background, founded Reportive, which exited to LinkedIn prior to Superhuman. Um, he's also an investor in Todd and Rahul's Angel Fund. So he has a fund with Todd Goldberg and they invest in seed stage companies and a few Series A rounds. 
I also studied comp sci at the University of Cambridge and just like many of the Levels team members, is a huge car nut. So turn it over to Rahul. Um, it would be very cool to hear about thoughts on velocity, product market fit, and just the way that the Superhuman team undertakes some of the, the development to really create a product based on flow state. So I'll hand it over to you, Rahul. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Can folks hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Okay, so that is, that is a lot to cover in five minutes. So I'm, I'm going to do my best in a whistle stop tour. Uh, so first, some re reflections on product market fits, and actually, let me just put a resource here. Oh, wonderful! I, I love people loving Superhuman in the chat. So I'm just going to put a resource here in the chat in case you have not yet seen it. This is the Superhuman product market fit engine, probably outside of my companies and my fund, the thing I'm best known for. And this really is a result of an obsession I've had with figuring out what product market fit is and how do you drive it. It turns out that product market fit is the number one reason why startups succeed, and the lack of product market fit is the number one reason why startups fail. And there's a lot more nuance beyond that, but the question I became obsessed with was can you define it more concretely than that? Can you measure it? Because if you can measure it, and obviously your, your company is an embodiment of this idea, if you can measure something, you can optimize something. And it turns out that you can measure product market fit and you can optimize it. And that is the, the topic of the engine. Some reflections after running it uh, for a, a lot of years now at Superhuman and with many of the portfolio companies I've invested in is that there's no silver bullet. I think I said this in that article, I've said this in every talk I've given on the topic, but maybe some people walk away from that with the idea that, cool, all you have to do is implement this survey, uh, ask the users what they want, do all the segmentation, and if you haven't read the article, it's quite involved, but it makes a ton of sense, I'd highly recommend you go and read it, and then we're done. But actually, nothing could be further from the truth. When you do the products market fit engine, it really is designed to be something that you keep on running over a long period of time. If it works, and it will work, you'll start growing rapidly in a segment, but then what will happen is you'll want to grow even faster. And so you'll start moving to adjacent segments or maybe less intentful audiences. Their metrics, their scores, the product market fit score may well come in lower. I think Andrew Chen calls this the law of shitty metrics, or rather it's, it's another lens on the same law, but that's okay. What we're here to do is to constantly bring that metric back up. And so what we did at Superhuman, if you're familiar with the article is we started with a, a really low product market fit score. I think it was maybe 20, 22% at the time when we came up with this methodology, systematically increased it up to the high 60s. And since then it has oscillated between about 50 and 60 perfectly reasonable, perfectly normal. The reason it will come down is because you are becoming successful and you're encountering new types of people and it's our job to keep on pushing it back up. So that's some quick thoughts on products market fits. Um, I'm happy to spend more time uh, with anyone who is working closely on the endeavor. It's, it's a passion area of mine. It's something I, I care a lot about. Uh, the other things I think I was asked to touch upon are product development and velocity. So quickly on product development, broadly speaking, I see two types of team. Number one, there's the type of team that leans very heavily into vision. And number two, there's the type of team that leans very heavily into uh, feedback. Let's, let, let's address all the customer feedback they're getting. If you are too far in either extreme, I do believe that you won't be a successful startup. The teams that lean too heavily into vision will never increase the percentage of the population or the, the large number of people that would be very disappointed without their products, people who really love their product. And that's a conclusion which is fairly obvious if you work the product market fit engine all the way through. On the other hand, the teams that solely systematically address objections that people have to using the product they'll eventually be overtaken by competitors because somebody else will take the thing that they do that's magical, the thing that no one was asking for. In the case of superhuman, that's speed. No one was asking for fast, but someone could take that thing and do it even better. 
So what's incumbent, I think, upon anyone who is uh, doing products or development uh, or running a startup is to find the right balance between leaning into vision and systematically addressing objection. And the way that we do this at Superhuman is, of course, we use the product market fits engine, but we go into each quarter and more recently, as our planning cycles have got longer, into each year saying, OK, we're going to spend roughly half our time doubling down on what people love. That's going to, for us, that's going to be like a speed and keyboard shortcuts and aesthetics and half our time systematically addressing objections. And that's where a standard voice of the customer product management customer success program can fit in. But if you just do one or the other, it's not likely to go well. So that's my thoughts on uh, product development. And then, then lastly, on velocity, uh, it can be tempting as a company is doing well, which you all are, to start to do lots of things. This is usually a mistake. It is uh, almost always better to do fewer things, but to focus on them and to do them to the best of your abilities. Because uh, startups are really a game of dominoes. And, and, and the, the strategy of a startup is to figure out how to sequence the dominoes, which one to tip over first, and how they keep on knocking over larger and larger dominoes. And there's a, uh, a domino video that went viral, I don't know, like 10, 15 years ago, that ends up showing you can start with just the tiniest little of dominoes. You know, maybe it doesn't weigh more than 10 grams, but can ultimately end up knocking over slabs of stone that probably weigh a ton or more. Uh, and that's what you're looking for. You're looking for that momentum. And the key to unlocking it is to picking your battles, doing as few things as you can get away with by doing those things at a world-class level. So those are my thoughts on products market fits, on product development and velocity. Uh, I'm happy to hang around if you want to uh, answer any questions. Also happy to work more closely with anyone who wants to go deeper on any of these topics. Very cool. Well, we really, really appreciate all the insight. I know the first round article has been circulated amongst the team many times, so we uh, we refer to it often. Um, if anyone hasn't had a chance to listen to our good friends over at Acquired, there are a couple episodes that they did with Raul that are very cool where he goes deeper into everything around product dev and fundraising, and it's very cool to hear your thoughts and hear your thought process. So appreciate you being here and being such a supporter of what we're doing. Absolutely. You're welcome to stick around. Uh, you don't have to feel uh, feel like you have to stay, but uh, if you want okay. to, yeah. Okay, well, what I'll do is I'll just put my email and my Twitter DMs, which are open in the chat. Anyone feel free to get in touch. I wish you the best of luck. I'm happy to come back and help at any point. Keep on rocking. Perfect. Thanks, Ro. Appreciate it. Okay, bye. All right, company priorities as of October 2021. So nothing has changed here as far as what we're focused on. Um, to reiterate, membership model, so migrating subscriptions and product, the guided journey, which is a holistic effort amongst the team. Uh, Scott is digging in deep on that and leading the initiative. Uh, social experiments, so everything that Alan and Kunal and the team is working on pertaining to getting deeper on social within the product. And then other initiatives supporting 10K members is an engine ops infra uh, area that we're digging into, table stakes design, table stakes data privacy, supplemental testing, and the nutritionist marketplace. So very good work there. Culture, kudos. So three notable ones. Uh, big congratulations to Josh and Kate. Today is their wedding day. And we truly hope that Josh does not see this video if he is living the cultural values of Levels. We hope he doesn't see it until mid-October when he's back. But um, we'll be thinking about the two of you and big, uh, big congratulations on that. Uh, how is on his cross country road trip and last weekend, how Justin, Sam and I all had a chance to meet up, which is very cool. And so he ended up stopping in Toronto and who else to meet up with then Campbell Barron himself. So it's cool to see how this levels IRL meetup in this ecosystem is coming together. Um, from an ownership standpoint, so hat tip to Braden, um, we're starting to outsource some of the transactional work that we do to uh, the Athena team, so using EAs where we can, and Braden proactively found something that was transactional that he had in his uh, area of responsibility and outsourced, and then closed the loop with the team. Not only did he do that and really take ownership of it, but he proactively said, hey, here are some other things that I know there is overlap between what I'm working on and you're working on. Um, happy to take those on. So it's just anytime we can help each other out as a team, use sociality. Anytime we can do that, it really uh, makes a difference. So 
Braden, we always appreciate your willingness to go that extra mile. Uh, on to product and eng. On membership, uh, Shin Lu took over engineering to wrap up phase one, which is getting very, very close. Um, what that's going to look like when it goes live, hopefully sometime next week, is very similar to our checkout flow that we have now. There'll be an extra page that talks about membership as a sort of as a separate thing that you buy. And then the following page will be similar to our subscription page that we have now. So people who are signing up for the first time will be able to uh, get on a subscription path right away and have sensors sent like every month, every other month, et cetera. Um, this is very exciting and uh, we'll hopefully see something next week. The images on the right side are just a conceptual sketch from Alan, but every slide is better with an Alan design on it. So um, I put that on there. Uh, and then finally on blood work, one last uh, slide, please, Ben. Um, we're moving forward. Marillo has uh, hit the ground running on the engineering side. Um, it's been great. We had a meeting with them earlier this week uh, to talk about that integration and it moves forward. We should hopefully have a phase two out in the next couple of weeks, um, which will be terrific. And that is all for me. Thank you guys. That's great. Thanks, GM. And plus one, anytime there is Allen influence on a slide or some type of image, it always ups, ups the game. So that's awesome to see. On to John. Yes. Um, tagging B1, great progress this week. We work on defining the way we want to store uh, structured data into our database. So we added a new column in the database and changed all the, all the APIs to support that. On the mobile front, as you can see in the animation on the right, we cre created a custom text input that allows us to have a different treatment when a tag is found. Uh, behind the scenes, the same structure that we defined in the backend is populated on the fly while the user while the user is typing. Um, there are some limitations with the text input uh, regarding the styles we can apply to the text when a tag is found. So for now, we are displaying them in similar to the Twitter hashtags that is just using a different color. Uh, I will coordinate with Alan to make this look better. And finally, for the next week, we will try to display hard-coded uh suggestions in in the app so uh, that is it very cool thank you john and thank you team it's going to be very cool to see this come to life on to scoring so marillo is out this week but we've got a video here okay hey, so for additive scoring we have a quick update this week uh mostly just the uh, changes based on your feedback has have been pushed out uh, most notably, we're back now from a 0 to 100 score. Uh, and yeah, thanks for everyone who tried this out. And uh, yeah, thanks to David who helped uh, uncover a really gnarly bug that was just lowering everyone's scores. Uh, that has also been fixed, the PR is up. So yeah, so we're about ready uh, to start pushing this out to members and getting their feedback. That's it for edited scoring this week. Thank you. There we go. We should be good. Perfect. That's the last video. I think Kunal is next with social. Yep. Not too many updates on social. We've been mostly building um, and we've got comments coming in soon. Um, and that's really the, the crux of a lot of social activity on the app, actually having members interfacing with other members on the app. So it's something we're really looking forward to. Um, so we can expect that next week. And besides that, we've been collecting a bunch of feedback and talking to some of the members who've been using the new um, community glucose view. And some have liked it so much, they've actually asked that some other members that they know that are using the app also be added. So that was exciting to see. Beyond that, check out more at levels.linked slash social. And that's all for me. Thanks. Perfect, thanks Kunal. On to Tom with Nutritionist Marketplace, which is very close. Yes, this is on track to be released to a couple hundred members by the end of next week, uh, which is very exciting. So notably this week, Gabriel did a ton of work, deployed 
tested backend changes, and then also several app builds internally. So it was really fun to get in there and actually interact with it and see what it looks like, which you can see in that video there on the right. And then uh, a lot of just testing and feedback from David Allen and I. So next week, uh, changing some copy and, and editing some profiles and some more testing, and then we'll release likely in the back half of the week. That's it. Awesome. We're so close on this one and it's been cool to see it come together on time and it's, uh, it's being shipped very quick. So great work team on all the work going into it. Next slide, uh, Steph on table stakes design. Yeah. So, uh, Justin is technically the responsible owner for this, but he's been out this week. So I get to steal his thunder a bit. Uh, so this week, what the main things that got work done were iconography, color system and cards. And so for iconography, we've removed all the PNG files and now relying solely on the material icons library for both the V2 charts and all the icons on the zones list. And so now you yeah, like the exercise one and then the food one and then the, um, the notes and then anomaly as well. Uh, color system is now up to date with surface colors, type colors for text and scoring colors. Um, Card styling got a ton more consistent this week. And so along with the icons, just updated padding and margins and the zone badges are now in the upper right hand corner and smaller. And with the zone badges, I, I worked with Alan this week as well to implement some new logic around um, that strenuous exercise icon is gone from the exercise icon itself. And instead we're rendering the pink heart, heart icon for multi-activity zones that do have strenuous exercise and then white heart icons for exercise only zones. And so it's just a little bit more clear and we give a little bit more context to the user um, for why they might not receive a score for a certain zone. And then the most exciting part has just been code cleanup in the sense of we got to purge thousands of lines of code this week around removing all the V1 legacy charts for um, yeah, the charts that are no longer in use and also just moving towards reusing a lot of components between the screens. And so specifically for zones, relying on reusable components and then we're not just doing one-off implementations and that'll ensure correct views as well as correct behavior with like opacity and, um, and highlights and whatnot. Um, shout out to Alan for the, all the dialogue this week and all the great specifications. Um, Kina, uh, next week, I'm gonna continue to work on card updates and then jump into modals and buttons. And yeah, to learn more, you can go to the, the table stakes design link and that's it. Awesome. This is coming along nicely. It's great to hear even things like purging a lot of the lines that are no longer necessary. So it's not just sitting there and, uh, and bloating our minds with cognitive load. So uh, very cool team. On to Scott, clear eyes, full heart, guided journey. Hit this slide, buddy. <laughs> All right, Clear Eyes, Full Heart. This is going to be a uh, Clear Eyes week. We're kind of uh, toggling back and forth. Uh, I didn't make much progress this week, candidly, so I'm not going to bore you with uh, just filler content, but uh, go to the next slide. One of the things I did want to say was that we got um, some really good clarity this week around this tool called Post Hog. So we uh, heretofore had only had access to kind of things in the database. So if you took an action in the app, like for example, a food log, that would be represented as one little row in the database. And so we could do a little bit of analytics around how many unique users were creating food logs, et cetera. But what we didn't have access to was things like who's even visiting the catalog or who's uh, maybe looking at a challenge, uh, the details screen of a challenge. These are things that don't create side effects. They don't create like a data trail inside of our database. And so we uh, previously did not have access to this, but uh, this week, I felt like we got really good clarity on, I guess, what I would call a default posture for how we're going to use post hoc. So um, this is not going to be our end all be all uh, business intelligence tool. But what we did get some clarity on is, hey, we want to make sure that we have a really good insight into how our customers are using our app. Uh, we are a company that deals a lot with data and insights into how your body is functioning on the internal side. So I think we're bringing a similar level of granularity and detail to understand how our customers are using um, while still being able to respect things like their privacy, uh, still letting them be able to opt out. And, and, and on the data side, still caring about things like personal health information and personally identifiable information, not ever getting into post hoc. So we're going to have really, really good granular detail on a large anonymous set of data. Uh, and from product land, that's fantastic because that means we just get to make better decisions. Um, I'll give you one example. Um, another sort of like thing we stumbled upon um, from Helena. We found out that uh, around 45% of our users 
uh, had submitted a food log but had never put any text in that food log. So as we think about new things like tagging coming on board, these are good data points for us to have because it just shows that we need to go a little bit further to indicate what is the value of even putting stuff inside of a food log? Um, why would you even put the ingredients or the text? And so um, if we're not like illuminating that sort of thing and it's just sort of magically happening with auto tagging in the back end, people might not actually discover that. So um, these data points are, are, are good to have access to. So that's just one example from um, this week of stuff that we're hopefully gonna have easier access to by virtue of post hoc. So. That's it for me. Great to hear. And now Helena is going to take a deep dive into data. Very Sorry cool. if I stole your, uh, one, of your, one of your data points there. <laughs> no, no, it's good. I'm glad that you brought that up. Um, yeah, so for the first data science update, um, I'm going to dive right in. So um, I think an important question to ask when we think about you know, our mission and our goals as a company is, okay, who are our members and what are they hoping to gain from using levels? Um, so if you see this sort of map of the US, um, this map is kind of misleading and I debated putting it in here, but I think um, you know, as we ramp up data science and statistics, it's important to be mindful of how we present information and how we pull data in general and how we measure up to other wearable companies with this. Um, so from this graph, it looks like a lot of our members come from California or New York. Um, but actually, 63% of our total members are not from either of those states, uh, which is pretty cool because we might expect the exact opposite. We might expect all of our members to basically come from California, um, which they don't. Um, so then we sort of look at, okay, the bottom graph is, you know, average age within each primary interest that the user um, put on their consult form coded by sex. So from a research perspective, this is quite interesting because the average age for women is higher in pretty much all of these categories, um, you know, with improved sleep having the largest disparity between, um, you know, men and women. It seems that, you know, the average age of men, like who want to improve sleep is, is noticeably younger than the average, average age of women. And I wonder why that is. Um, and you know what lifestyle wise might make this so. So I see a ton of potential con content and research um, around you know demographic characteristics. And if anything, this is proof that maybe we should start collecting just a little bit more information about our members and who they are so that we can start to cater the experience a little bit more intentionally. Um, and then if we look at age of our members in general, I thought this was very interesting. So the overall, um, age of our members, the average age is 43. Um, we are 53% women. That's uh, data coming from January of this year to September 1st of this year. Um, and I thought this graph was pretty interesting too, because there's a higher density of men in like the th age 30 to 40 range um, than women. Um, so, you know, the average age of men, which is 41, is lower um, than that of women that's 45. Um, and another thing I think is really cool is that we actually have a 90 year old man and an 83 year old woman actively using levels. Um, and so I think that we should start to really think about, you know, what is our target age range? We're all about education. So I wonder, you know, how are we doing on targeting a younger audience? Um, should we start to have some conversations about, you know, how we're doing within certain groups of people? Um, you know, for example, like I wonder if we should reach out to one of our oldest members and see, you know, get a feel for why they chose to join Levels um, and, you know, reach out to our youngest members. Uh, I'm hypothesizing that we don't have as many young people because of price, but maybe there's something, you know, almost intimidating even about, you know, like the way our patch looks or the way our app looks or the functionality of the app that is also influencing things like age. Um, and you can go to the next slide. So then after sort of understanding, okay, like who are our users? What do they wanna gain from this experience? We can take a look at how we're doing. So just to re reiterate on what a lot of us already know, we've been adding around a thousand members per month um, so far this year. So that's from January to about September 1st, 21.9% um, of members have not applied or connected their first sensor. Um, so it looks like we're losing around 20% of people after just sensor delivered. Um, you know, they get their sensor um, and then 20% of people every month are just not putting it on. Um, so that sort of begs the question, okay, you know, how long do our members wait after they receive their first sensor to put it on? Um, and they wait an average of 20 days. 
Um, however, in May, uh, you could see from this purple graph on the right there, um, you know, our new members waited an average of 41 days to put on their first sensor from the day they received it to the day they put it on. Um, I don't know what happened in May, but we did see a larger influx of members in that month. So it would be useful to track um, the answer to questions like, you know, why did we get this influx? Who are our members? What brought them here? And then how are we doing, et cetera? Um, the next step from there, and I've started to do this, but I don't want to take up too much time, is tracking member engagement in the app. Um, you know, as far as logging is concerned, we're doing pretty good. You know, 96% of our members with glucose data have either, you know, logged a food note or taken a photo of food. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean they've done this consistently every day. Um, I need to run those numbers and see how we're doing there, but I'm curious to see how things like the tagging project will influence the consistency of note logging and hopefully um, that will be a part of the next update. So thanks and uh, that's it for this week. That's awesome. Thanks, Helena. Very cool to see all the, the data finally start to be visualized where instead of having anecdotes about uh, members' age or gender demographic, we can actually see the differences. So thank you for all the work there. Uh, Alan with design. Hey, everybody. Cool. Um, so let's actually just jump to the next slide. <laughs> and first of all, thank you so much, Helena. That was really interesting. Um, a 93-year-old. I'm really impressed. So this week, uh, there was four primary focus areas. Um, there was a small jam that I did just on observability and sort of the future of the dashboard as real time comes to be. Um, it, turned, it was a small thing turned into like a slightly more monetized effort. Uh, a lot of work on onboarding, um, getting the day review in good shape so that we can actually get to start building it. And then of course, some triage uh, for design related to the dashboard. Uh, so next slide, please. So yes, uh, the dashboard launched last week with uh, a view intended primarily for a full 24 hour day review. And so it was missing some aspects of the dashboard that we wanted and that's okay. It's a good intermediate state. We wanna ship quickly, but of course it did raise a bunch of issues with relating to how logs relate to the line. Um, some accessibility issues related to that little gradient. What do we do with pending data? And so I spent a fair bit of time looking at that and figuring out how we can get um, an experience that more closely maps to what users are expecting on that line. So things like dealing with pending data, um, line treatments for logs, you know, we all like the dots on the line. They were removed for the 24 hour view. We were intending to have a time selector, but you know, perhaps we bring it back. I think what we need to do is try to way to balance that with accessibility, but also seeing the correlation of data there with respect to logs. Um, and then adding logs directly on the line, you know, that's a big, a big hit. We intended to get to that. And so this sort of forced that question a little bit earlier. Uh, next slide. Uh, the day review. So yeah, we're in pretty good shape to, I think, move, <laughs> I'll defer to Scott on this, but I think getting pretty close to getting to a place where we can start actually building the day review. And one of the key parts of that is getting better data. And so within the day review, there's going to be this opportunity to, before we reveal your metabolic score and sort of our suggestions for the day, giving you a chance to sort of recap yesterday. Did you miss any logs? Uh, we'll allow you to scrub on the line, add a missing log, and then we'll reveal your score and give you some suggestions for the day. Uh, next slide. Onboarding. So right now onboarding is, um, hasn't been touched in a while. And there's also gonna be this future state where perhaps the medical consult, all these disparate experiences that are required to get you purchasing levels or getting you into the experience, perhaps that happens all within the app. So we start looking at onboarding. There's a lot of overlap here with the guided journey. Um, as sort of Scott and Helena have noted, we need to know a little bit more about you. So just some basic biometrics, like how much do you weigh? How tall are you? Um, evolving how we ask about, you know, gender, you know, right now it's a binary. We want to be able to create space for um, alternatives there and then bringing things like the medical consult in. So hopefully the app in the future will be sort of your one-stop shop for um, getting started with levels. Uh, next slide. And then the prettier slide, <laughs> um, I love gradients. So looking a little bit about how we might potentially in the future evolve the dashboard. Um, and you know, this is just experimentation, but I think you know, what we're talking about here is finding a way to almost have like a heads up display for your data. And so in a world where it's not just glucose, potentially it's multi-analyte, we've got ketones and you know, cortisol and potentially other signals 
um, how can we be more relevant to you in the moment while also supporting um, sort of that trace, trace need so you can see change over time and so on. So here we've got a couple of different treatments for more of a widget type model. Um, you know, you've got the score there, you've got some suggestions, your food logs, a user can customize it and drag it around and change it to what's most relevant for them. Um, you know, and then the third one, we've got an example of like, maybe we see you're spiking and we give you like a task, like a 15 minute walk. So they've got eight minutes left till they've done their walk to prevent that spike. Or perhaps we're tracking things like fasting. So on the far right here, perhaps we're integrated with another app or we have our own fasting experience and that person's got ketones at the top and they've got sort of a fasting timer for themselves they're doing a 24 hour fast. So this is the kind of stuff that we're starting to look at a little bit more closely and that's it for design this week. That's great, thanks, Ellen. Very cool uh, vision-based work with all of the, all of these uh, images that you're putting together and concepts, and then everything you're doing around the guided journey. So it's cool to see that come together. On to uh, hiring updates. So um, hand it over to Scott um, if you want to talk a little bit about. Uh, I'm gonna pick it off David. here. Okay, David. Yeah, so um, quick update on the product hiring front. So as you know, in the last couple of months, we've been uh, exploring as the company's been growing, how we might um, how we might hire for uh, um, all of the new operational complexities we're encountering um, needs to come up with um, better ways to improve the product development process, road mapping, communicating all these things. And we were looking externally for this. We put together a whole bunch of needs. And as we were doing that, we um, kind of just saw that the one of the... Um, the perfect candidates for this already existed within the company. So I'm thrilled to announce that Scott will be uh, stepping into product as our new head of product uh, effective today. I'm super excited about this. He has a lot of experience in his past roles as a founder and product owner uh, at companies at our stage and this like our stage plus. So he has a lot of like a, well, um, a depth of experience in coming up with these systems to help um, help take our product development process to the next level. And yeah, it's gonna, um, it's going to free up a lot of my time to focus in on the emerging product areas, the things that are on the horizon as we think about the company becoming more of an um, observability company. What is levels like? Uh, what does levels mean in those contexts? I'll be I'll be having more time to focus on, um, yeah, these emerging product areas, and then uh, really doubling down on the responsible individuals model. So I've been starting to uh, help out people like Braden and the rest of the team up level on product, and hopefully we can have anyone who's interested in product um, get any feedback they need to up level and become a responsible individual. Uh, more of my time doing that and on hiring as well. So um, yeah, Scott, any, uh, any thoughts on your end? Sure. Um, I, I mean, first off, I just wanna say thanks. I mean, I think that like, when I thought about taking on a role, I think there's a big concern coming into a company and taking on more responsibility. There's a big sense of wonder of, hey, if I'm gonna step into a new role, like do I have a, a team around me uh, that's going to help support me uh, in that and 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 really be there to show up to sort of build around. So the answer there was obviously a yes. Um, I, I never had any doubts around um, wanting to be that uh, that function um, for the company. So um, I, I think too, I, I, there's a big sense of, I think I just joined um, at the right time. I got very lucky. And I think that th there's, it really speaks to how much people have short toes here, right? No one's really territorial. There's no egos going on. Um, it's been a really easy conversation around us wanting to slot into things that we've done before, things that we feel like we can be good at and things that we just want to spend our time doing. And I think that's that's absolutely the best place that you can be in terms of org structure and people moving around. Um, so I'm excited uh, about this. I think um, I'm going to need everybody's help. I mean, I think this is um, not a role where I expect to come in and just kind of have all the right answers. I'm going to be leaning on everybody else to uh, help, uh, you know, as a group come collectively to what the next version of levels is that we want to build. So um, hopefully my experience from the past is going to be a good guide here. Um, but, you know, I think that uh, where there's gaps or um, where we want to make it different for levels than it was in the past for me, then um, hopefully we can all do that little journey together. So I'm excited. Very cool. Thank you, Scott. And we are thrilled that you'll be leading product. That's great. Uh, no changes to support specialist role. Lots of great candidates in the pipeline. Um, Chris continues to vet the candidates coming in and be blown away by the, the pool of talent. Um, software eng role is still open. So if anybody is watching this and knows great engineers, feel free to reach out to Andrew, Sam, 
uh, Scott, David, anyone. So I uh, would love to hear from you. On to Chris Jones with Member awesome. Insights. Thanks, Ben. So uh, it may come to um, surprise to everyone that this slide has not been approved by Alan. Um, so if that, you know, I, I know I thought about it for a second, I'm like, it's, it's close. A um, couple updates. We already talked about a little bit the text analytics. I had shown some earlier pilots from some of the pilots we were doing. The exciting thing is we decided to move forward with somatic contracts were signed. We now have data uploaded through yesterday for both NPS and CSAT data. So those are going to be the two primary areas of focus. And you can expect to start seeing regular analysis on that within the, at least the monthly operational decks. Because at the weekly, we don't have enough volume to really be, on, be trends. There's just not enough comments at a weekly clip. So it'll be part of the monthly operation decks going forward. So super excited about that. Uh, related to some of the data that Helena and team showed, um, Mike D and I are working on how do we start reaching out to the people that did order, but we don't see their glucose data. And I'd see how it's a combination of both research and support. So when people get stuck on step A, not only the, hey, can you tell us, let us know where you got in the program and we just blindly take the data, but they were actually surfacing up the support content right behind it to actually help them in the next step. So for me, it's gonna be an interesting of like merging both hats of like research and support within one delivery mechanism to kind of help them in their journey and be helpful and still gaining a lot of knowledge around like why are they getting stuck and where are they having problems. Uh, on the support, we already talked about the 90% the emails, which is awesome. A, uh, the other area um, on kind of the content side is since we launched the helpfulness score, which is the, the uh, survey at the end of all of our support articles, to date, we are at 90% helpful, which is awesome. So great job to the content team. This past week, it was as high as 96. Um, so that means that people are reading the content and they're having a good experience. And the ones that don't score high are the ones that we would expect. Things like, like this one, like, or the one like where we're not available or we're not in their country or um, when sensor accuracy. So the, the low performers are the ones that we actually would expect low scores on because we're kind of delivering bad news. Uh, and then um, uh, Jesse just completed a workflow analysis as we looked at where are we using automation within Help Scout to make so we can handle more questions with less staff and be more efficient. What what are we using? What do we need to add? What do we need to make modifications for? And just kind of more of an analysis. So um, thanks Jesse and the team for contributing on that. And we routinely worked with Truepill on all of the changes for the Dexcom IRB and making improvements on their SLA front. And that's it for member experience. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. I think we are getting tighter on time. So um, we'll pick up time where we can, but the shares will likely go into the uh, after forum section. So on to growth for the week. So weekly recognized revenue at 119, surpassed our goal of 75. Monthly, we ended the month at 611. So strong there. 81 in cash, no changes to debt and 42 months of runway. Uh, monthly, quick recap. So 611 and 599k in cash. Strong month. It's always good to look year over year. So we've had some strong growth from a recognized revenue standpoint. In September of 20, we were at 142k and now we're at 611. So that's 332% year over year growth. Um, as far as subscription revenue, very big jump there. 16k in September of 20 and 230k in September of 21. So 13, 74% year over year growth. On to growth theme of the week, which is project debt. So what is project debt? Well, it's very analogous to tech debt, which many of us are familiar with. The more projects that we take on, and hat tip Seth Godin, he did a podcast about this, so I think he actually coined the term one or two weeks ago. But project debt is the more projects that we take on as a team, um, the more that we do individually, the more that we have this urge or the sense that we should do a second iteration of a project. It's pretty easy when a project isn't successful to say, hey, let's not do another iteration. What's really hard is when we have many projects that are successful and we have to consciously say, hey, the opportunity cost of not experimenting with a new project, let's say the community challenge is a good one, where not experimenting with a new project versus doing another iteration of that becomes a direct trade-off. So who has a lot of project debt? No one else than this guy, the cat in the hat. This guy carries so much project debt, it's crazy. And we might as well do a quick run through because I love this book. 
So here he is. We're, we're the team. The little kids staring at him are the team. And they're like, man, what are you doing? So put me down, said the fish. This is no fun at all. Put me down, said the fish. I do not wish to fall. Have no fear, said the cat. I will not let you fall. I will hold you up high as I stand on a ball with a book on one hand and a cup on my hat. But that is not all I can do, said the cat. Look at me, look at me, look at me now. It is fun to have fun, but you have to know how. I can hold up the cup and the milk and the cake. I can hold up these books and the fish on the rake. I can hold the toy ship and the little toy man. And look, with my tail, I can hold a red fan. I can fan with the fan as I hop on the ball, but that is not all. Oh, no, that is not all. That's what the cat said. Then he fell on his head. He came down with a bump from up there on the ball. And Sally and I, we saw all the things fall. And our fish came down too. He fell into a pot. He said, do I like this? Oh, no, I do not. This is not a good game, said our fish as he lit. No, I do not like it. Not one little bit. So the takeaway is we should feel, uh, com we should feel obliged to really assess our project debt as we take on more and more of these projects as responsible individuals and hold ourselves accountable to it. So that is growth for the week. On to Dom. Tough act to follow there. Okay, so promo code performance for September. Um, just quickly, so these are color coded here on the left side, gray, green, and blue. So gray are email conversion mechanisms, um, which generated 23% of revenue this month. So double opt, which is uh, when people sign up for the wait list and they read their email carefully, they get a link to purchase. Um, the newsletter refers to a test that Haney uh, ran, which, which put a link in the newsletter. So uh, great to see that these are driving significant revenue. We haven't really needed to rely on them or optimize them, but no doubt they're going to be growth levers that we can pull on in the future. Um, and then user referrals. So these drive anywhere from four to 7% reliably month over month. Um, and again, also, uh, we think this is a pretty good sign given that this is buried within the app. Um, and we have a relatively small number of monthly subscribers, um, but this is going to be an area that we're going to focus on in the future for sure. And then lastly, um, the partner codes, nothing major to call out here other than I guess Hyman continues to perform extremely strongly. That podcast dropped almost two months ago in the beginning of August um, and continued throughout September to do 20 to 30 conversions per week, which is uh, yeah, stronger than any other uh, type of podcast or promotion we've seen to date. I think that's it on this slide. Cool. All right. So speaking of project debt, um, I might have to talk about relationship debt at some point. This was a debrief that I ran on a small military engagement um, over the summer. Overall, it was you know, reasonably successful and that the military is really positive about levels in CGM and is spreading the word and they want to do more work with us. Um, and the, the main goal here was, was learning, I would say. Like we, we know that we don't want to pursue military as a market right now, but when we embark on these enterprise experiments, it's really to uh, better understand these markets and even understand just what it takes to learn more about them and run a pilot like this one. So, um, I would say the takeaways are that you know interacting with the government is is quite difficult and time consuming and there are many hoops to jump through and constraints um which is something that we knew going in but good to validate and th there was relatively low engagement overall so uh only seven of the 15 participants these are army special ops people actually use the levels app it's difficult to know uh why because as is often the case with the military we don't have direct interaction with the people using the app or going through third parties. Um, but the bottom line is that there's a lot of handholding that is required. Um, any type of friction, even just you know the, the two apps, as an example, is kind of a deal breaker for a population like this. So um, we, we probably won't be focusing on military in the near term, but good to learn more about some of these markets that will have potential later on. That's it. Perfect, thanks, Tommy. On to, I believe, uh, Stacy, are you presenting code? Yep. Perfect. All right. Um, at the beginning of this week, it was a blast joining Casey in LA to attend Code Conference. Code is Kara Swisher's conference. Tech Who's Who from all around the world 
uh, convened to talk about the new exciting things that are happening in the digital space. So you can see um, center top actually Elon joined on Tuesday to present. We were, Casey and I were seated about 20 feet from him and um, were able to tweet out a few things from his talk. Uh, these are super A-listers in the space. And so it's an incredible honor for Levels to be invited. And then of course, for Casey to be given um, a place on stage to share about our mission. So Wednesday morning, she was on stage with Whoop and with our friend Joel Holder. Um, to discuss all things um, metabolic health and human performance as they relate to wearables. She did an incredible job. We got a bunch of uh, sort of really flattering uh, conversations going on Twitter around this featuring her. And um, I think one of the, the coolest things that uh, was aside from the main stage event was uh, Casey was talking to Kara Swisher one night and um, her brother, Jeff, walks up and Kara goes, oh no, I was hoping you two wouldn't meet. Jeff hates levels and Kara walks away. And so um, over the course of the next 45 minutes, Casey and Jeff are talking and apparently uh, had a 180 on his opinion of wearables and levels. And then the next day, Jeff tweets out this. I had the most I had the absolute pleasure of meeting and talking to one of the most dynamic individuals I have met in a while, Dr. Casey Means, about metabolic health, CGM, and a whole range of issues involving healthcare and delivery, one of the great benefits of CodeCon. So Casey, meeting Casey was a highlight of his experience. He's the, the you know, brother to the founder of the conference and um, has access to everyone. And we love that he highlighted that experience with her. Um, another amazing highlight was running into Jennifer Daniels, who uh, heads up the Emoji subcommittee, gave this incredible presentation and actually happens to be married to our very own Alex Lane. So um, she was incredible. Her presentation ha had everyone starstruck and thinking about the deeper implications of emojis. And it was so fun to meet her. She's pictured there at the bottom, um, the photo of me, Casey and Jennifer. And so, yeah incredible week and honor and um, we got some really great social coverage out of it that helped amplify our message so there you go i just have to jump in and give stacy some huge kudos um stacy was incredible as always she was just absolutely driving incredible assets creating beautiful images throughout the conference seeding social with lots of amazing quotes that got great reshares and was awesome moral support so super super appreciative of Stacey being there. And um, yeah, I think this conference was a huge success and i um, really glad we were able to participate. Amazing. Well, thank you to, to both of you for all the, the great work. And it's so cool to see uh, see everything from, I guess, the, the outside now come together and be presented at Forum. So thanks for all the work there. On to Haney. Yeah, so I'll run through content quickly. A couple of good pieces up this week. The Kelly Levesque one is another example of taking a podcast episode and editing it down into a Q&A. Uh, there's some good stuff there. And the tortilla wrap is kind of our return to some of our swap type pieces. You'll see a lot more of those coming. I also want to call out kind of in the middle here, um, one of the Instagram posts. So, you know, I'm sure most uh, folks on this call follow levels on Instagram, but um, just want to highlight the really awesome work that Stacy's doing. Um, and a contractor we're using uh, named Chris Urban is doing, we've really upped our Instagram game in terms of delivering not just promotion for the articles, but actual content from the articles onto Instagram. And I think the engagement's really uh, increased and, and this is something we're gonna put a lot more effort into. Um, one of the big things, I'll, I'll just highlight one thing here in the, the what else slide. Um, one of the things we wanted to do for a long time is to bring on some additional, not just experts to do reviews, we have um, a good database of those going, but actual, paid top editors who are gonna help. And a lot of the work that Casey's been shouldering in terms of, of really getting deep into reviewing the articles with me and helping me really produce them, making sure they're accurate, making sure we're, we're taking a real holistic look at things. Um, and with her help and her uh, network, we brought on three folks this week who are now um, gonna be working with us to help top edit um, all of our articles. So this is, is really a, an important first step in terms of scaling our content operation and being able to do a lot more the stat I just want to mention at the bottom, you might remember about a week ago, we ran a, a newsletter test where we tried sending out just a single article, the eggs article. So those are the stats from that. We had a very good open rate. Um, that's that's high for us, close to 30 is pretty good. 
Uh, three and a half CTR is probably our lowest ever. I suspect that's because we kind of gave away the TLDR in the newsletter itself. And, and we did that, you know, really intentionally. We wanted folks to, to mostly just get the information that we were trying to deliver with that article. Um, if they click through, fine. Um, we'll we'll test this again in lots of different ways and try different amounts of, of delivering, you know, how much content we put in an email. But the fact that we got opens is, is pretty good, um, even for a, a subject that, you know, we love, but is covered a lot in the health uh, type press. So that people wanted our take on it, I think is encouraging. Um, and just one more slide. Uh, we also launched this week something uh, we've been meaning to do forever, which is to put better graphics into our posts. As you guys know, our posts are an awful lot of text. Um, and I have tried a couple of different times using some of my old tricks um, from the, the print days to get infographics and things like that in there. And, and the efforts have, have kind of failed. I just haven't quite dialed it in. And a big kudos here to Sam for just sort of um, being scrappy, reaching out to a designer named Jeff Chan, who'd done some work for us and, and did some work in his first round review piece and just said, hey, come up with something. Just try something with very little interaction from us. And Jeff produced some really nice graphics, both taking charts and making them look very levelsy, so they're not just screen grabs out of studies, but also uh, nice templates for putting pull quotes into stories. So. You'll see these in, uh, I think we've got them in the Sarah Gottfried piece. Um, we've got them in the Kelly Levesque piece. You'll see these kinds of graphics are popping up a lot more in the, the posts. Um, and I think this is gonna really help just make our posts more engaging, uh, help people get through them, hopefully make them more shareable. So uh, super excited about that. That's it for content. I love it. Thanks, Haney. That's great. Very cool to see, uh, see this all come together. We are on to shares. So we're uh, right on the wire as far as time, but we'll dive into shares for, uh, for the team. We'll just go over. So Scott, if you want to kick things off. Cool. Uh, Work-wise, we are just talking to some unbelievable candidates. I know we had one acceptance on the engineering side this week, maybe not starting for a little while, but I, I'm just, I'm, I'm very impressed by the amount of people that are now seeking out, uh, levels. I talked to a very, very senior person at Apple right now. And so I just like, we're, we're attracting a lot of attention and I think people are starting to take us very seriously as a, as a, as an early bet, if they otherwise need a little bit more stability in their life. Um, on a personal basis, I, I don't even know, <laughs> just catching up this weekend. I don't know what I'm doing. So. Awesome. Very cool. Steph. So I have, um, Oh, wait, can you mute yours? <laughs> I have very exciting personal and professional overlap news. Um, I'm actually here with Helena right now. And uh, <laughs> some people, okay, I'll just keep you in the frame. <laughs> some people have um, like heard tidbits about this, but we booked an Airbnb together in San Diego for the month. And it has been so much fun to like, one, like learn from this data science extraordinaire but um but yeah it's just been so much fun to like hang out and spend time in san diego together and be really productive at work and so it's been a thrill we have a couch if anyone wants to come visit um but yeah it's just been such a joy yeah uh, we're only one weekend but it's been just like absolutely incredible to get to co-work together every day so uh yeah anyone uh anyone is welcome to to come hang out with us here <laughs> Amazing. Well, Sam now has competition for the digital nomad lifestyle. Alan. Wow. That's an awesome update. Um, so professionally, I'm, a, I'm very excited about uh, potentially moving towards like a really optimistic sort of palette palette. Um, so this is a sort of in the weeds, but um, I love making these gradient meshes. So I've um, been playing with that in my off hours. Um, not the focus of my time, but <laughs> can't help but do it when I'm when I'm procrastinating. Um, and personally, uh, my wife, as you noted at Code, um, I'm excited for her to come back. <laughs> it's been solo parenting here. So she comes back on Sunday and that'd be very good. <laughs> very cool. I'm sure that will be a lot of help needed and necessary. I think Mike D is out, but Mr. Jones. Uh, on the levels front, uh, I would say super excited about the, the, the participation we had with code. Like I thought it was an incredible event. As many of you know, I'm a big fo follower of Kara. Uh, so I also know Jeff. So uh, way to go, Casey. Um, I'm about to listen to the podcast on pivot of the biggest moments of code right after this meeting to get her takeaway of what she liked. On the personal front, as you can hear in the background, um, our puppy 
has got his last round of shots. So he's now a okay to go play with other pups in the field. So we are excited to actually get him off, uh, you know, meet some new friends. So that's it. Amazing. Well, keep us posted with any hot takes about levels in that podcast. How is out uh, Kunal? Um, on the levels front, um, just so exciting to, to see all the cool stuff. Um, sometimes I like read some of the content pieces and I'm blown away at how freaking good they are. So Haney, you're like killing it. Um, besides that, I spent a little bit of time in the Catskills with my girlfriend for her birthday and um, just got back from that. So I'm just going to have a relaxing weekend coming up. Very cool. Uh, levels front just amazed and big hat tip to Casey. She is absolutely crushing it. She has the busiest October coming up. She's doing podcasts for a whole new level. She's doing podcast recordings for other people. She's appearing at code and all of this content is being created. And it's one of those things where you just go like, I'm not sure how you're managing this, but it is truly amazing. So hat tip to Casey, very stoked on the levels front there. Uh, personal front, it was so cool to meet up with Hal and spend time with Justin and Sam last weekend and just sort of vibe in on that still. So uh, it's exciting to see that Steph and Helena are getting time together too. That's it, Haney. Yeah, I'll, I'll pick up on that personal and, and professional this week. I'm going to have lunch today with uh, Steph and Helena. We were trying to arrange a, a surprise uh, Haney pop-up head in the background, but I could not make it work there. So we're going to do lunch today. Um, and next weekend, we're headed to Seattle. We had to cancel a Hawaii trip, but we're going to Seattle instead. So I'm looking forward to meeting up with uh, Scott, hopefully Morgan there as well. That's it for me. Amazing. Pictures all around. Pictures all around, please. John. Uh, levels wise, uh, I really like version 1.3, huge change, all these new colors, UI elements all across the app. Um, congrats, congrats, Scott, for stepping into this new role, well-deserved. And uh, personally, a duck we rescued like four months ago, just found a family, so excited about that and about having a new spot open for a new rescue. Awesome. The Levels dog family is growing. Uh, Jesse. Uh, yeah, pretty unbelievable updates this week. Um, on the level side, I uh, just want to give a shout out to Braden for um, all the consistent initiative that you take. It's, it's really inspiring and it's, uh, it's great to work with you. Um, and um, here on Houston, it's raining. Uh, and if it doesn't stop soon, I'm about to take a very wet run for lunch. Nice. That sounds very Goggin-esque. Uh, yeah. Tommy. Uh, levels wise, definitely watching uh, Casey just crush it at code was extremely exciting for me. Um, and then also just seeing the wizardry of our engineering and product and design teams up close and personal over the last couple of weeks, working on the nutritionist marketplace. That was, you know, we were, we were doing concept brainstorms like two weeks ago. And then today I'm in the app and using the feature and it's amazing how quickly we can move. And then personally, um, booked a lot of travel this week. So just have a lot of weekends away coming up in Cape Cod and Boston and Portland and Seattle and a bunch of other places over the next couple of months. Awesome. Casey. Yeah. So I think professionally this week, seeing the responsible individual updates just gets me so excited. The, just like the amazing initiative and collaboration that's happening across all these projects is just totally electrifying to see. And the progress is just amazing. Um, so just so fun. It, also, Helena, your update on data. I hope we get more of those. Those are amazing just to kind of see the breakdown of what's happening under the hood. Um, and then I'm also just super amped about the stuff that's happening with content and scaling um, that Mike is really leading, bringing on the top editors who are going to be able to like really do the top down, um, higher level medical editing, um, bringing on Revel an agency to do some content writing for us, um, getting the graphics done. It's just all of these things are going to just take the content level to content to the next level. And it's just so cool to see Mike um, bringing on these awesome trusted partners to help us with that. So super excited. Personally, um, I'm heading to New York today. I'm going to be there for three months. I can't wait to see the Levels team on uh, Monday night. And um, I am hosting my best friend 
from my whole life, my best friend, her bachelorette party this weekend. And it's the first, I think it's the first bachelorette party I'm ever going to and hosting. And I am really, really excited. So <laughs> hopefully I'll survive. Amazing. Well, have lots of fun. Again, pictures, any IRL pictures, share them away. Uh, Gabe. Yeah, um, so much new exciting stuff in the app. Really enjoyed working on the Nutritionist Marketplace project um, with uh, Alan, Dave, and Tom. Um, personally, going to the last regular season White Sox game this weekend, which I'm looking forward to, as long as it doesn't get rained off, which is looking likely. Nice, very cool. I believe everyone else is out except Helena. Close it on out. Hey, um, Sam's actually right. No, he's not. So, yeah. <laughs> Um, but, uh, yeah, super excited to be in San Diego. I'm actually heading back to New York tomorrow, um, for a few days to surprise my dad for his birthday. And I'll also be at, um, the levels sort of shoot that we're doing and meet up. So I'm excited to meet some more people in person. Um, and then, you know, on a, on a level side, I'm so excited that I've been able to like dig through the data and get some like concrete, um, idea of like who our members are. Um, huge shout out to Scott because he's been a huge source of um, support and help, uh, you know, as I, as I sort of dig through our database. So yeah. Amazing. Well, thank you everyone. Strong week as always. Enjoy the weekend. We'll stop the share now. We'll stop recording and then we can go into our breakout room. So